we're going to get started with the afternoon session and and I think this is potentially the most exciting part of, of this meeting because we're going to be hearing about the research and development programs and hopefully soon upcoming trials uh, that are now being pursued by industry. Um, so there is, I think, uh, a panel of uh, six industry experts who are going to be part of this discussion. Um, but we're going to start first. A few of them are going to present their program. Um, we're going to cap it at 10 minutes, please. Um, and you know, perhaps after the presentation, uh, we'll sit down together and then leave the, the, the discussion and the questions for that part. So I'd like to introduce Catherine Norris from Neurovia, uh, who will be talking about Neurovia. <laughs> Yeah, we're a clinical stage company located in San Francisco. We have one product in development, which is MV1205 for the treatment of ALD. When we originally started our programs, we had two parallel programs in the works. We were going to run an adult study in the United States and a pediatric study outside of the US. Late last year, we ran into some issues with our manufacturing, so we had to put the adult study on hold. This study will be restarted after we receive additional funding. So we have the pediatric study, which is taking place outside of the US. Um, it's a phase one, two study um, in patients with cerebral disease. To be eligible for the study, you have to be between the ages of four and 18 years old. You have to have evidence of cerebral disease and not eligible for transplant or do not have access to transplant. So those are the entry criteria for that study. As I mentioned, it's outside of the US. Currently, we're in Australia, Russia, Latin America, and Western Europe. We aim to have our first patient enrolled at the beginning of next year. In addition to that, we just started an observational study in the United States. We don't have any patients enrolled. The goal of this study is to kind of access the baseline status and disease progression in children with ALD. So to be eligible for this study, you have to be between the ages of 2 and 13 years old, have a diagnosis of XALD, and willing to come in for visits every six months. So at those visits, they hopefully, if they follow standard of care, there won't be many additional assessments, but we're collecting MRI data, VLCFA data, and oxidative stress. So that is currently going on. It's in the startup process in the United States, and we're working with most of the institutions here today. So thank you. OK, great. So the uh, next speaker will be uh, Dr. David from Duterix. I decided I'm going to tell you a little bit about our drug, which is in phase one clinical trials. Um, first indication for AMN. First, yeah, good point. Phase one is the first time you go into human trials. That's where you're really looking at safety. Phase two is where you begin to look at does it work, efficacy as well as safety. And phase three is really does it work in a large patient population. And in, in AMN, we tend to look at more phase two, three, because it's an orphan disease. So you can tend to merge those together, which gets you to market quicker. So we have uh, a few more. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Uwe Maya from uh, Minorix, talking about their compound. Yes, uh, good afternoon and greetings from Europe. So I'm happy to give you a European contribution to that. Minorix is a small startup company. Uh, we were founded in the Barcelona area. So Barcelona and Catalonia have been more in the headlines for political upset recently. But I wanted to show there's also serious science going on in, in Catalonia. Um, we were founded in 2011. Um, our, yes, that looks better. Um, our lead compound is uh, MIN 102. And can I have the next? Oh, I can turn. Um, our lead compound is MIN 102. We have uh, completed a phase one study in healthy volunteers. So that is to the stage of development. 
and uh, we are now starting a what we call phase two three efficacy study and uh, as Sheila already explained uh, so due to the very few patients it will be one study really demonstrating efficacy we are not going the traditional way of phase one two three uh, as with big indications um, and that uh, phase two three study in adult AMN patients is going to start in Europe uh, anticipate in the next few weeks definitely before the end of this year uh, and it will be open for enrollment in the US um, early next year. Um, now, what is uh, pioglitazone? Um, it is uh, a selective uh, PIPA gamma agonist. Um, I mean, one or two is one of the metabolites of pioglitazone. So, we have just heard pioglitazone is an approved treatment for diabetes. Um, Min-102 is the so-called fourth metabolite of uh, pioglitazone M4, and we chose it over pioglitazone because it has a couple of advantages. And the major advantage is uh, it penetrates the blood-brain barrier in a better, um, in a higher ratio. That means it reaches uh, its target in the brain um, better than pioglitazone, as long as the blood-brain barrier is intact, as it is in AMN. Uh, also, it has a simpler metabolic profile. That means um, pioglitazone is metabolized to various molecules. Some of them are active, some of them are not. Um, I mean, one is just metabolized to one other uh, major compound, and that is also active in the field. So we hope that with this we avoid uh, unwanted drug-drug interactions. And uh, we have preclinical data suggesting that uh, MIN-102 can actually treat both components of the disease, the neurodegeneration and the neuroinflammation. Um, now, just a brief word. You have already heard PIPA-gamma receptors are so-called nuclear receptors. That means they don't sit on the surface of the cell, but they sit at the nucleus of the cell. And they upregulate genes uh, that we call pleiotropic. Uh, that means these are genes that help the cell to maintain, uh, to recover from stress, um, that protect the cells against various noxious stimuli from the outside, and are also inflammatory. Um, uh, can you turn next slide? Yeah, I think that's probably better. So you have seen that uh, pathological cascade various times today. Uh, there's the mutant gene, uh, there's the deficient transporter, uh, then you have the accumulation of very long-chain fatty acids. And that leads uh, to a lot of uh, dysfunctions, mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, oxidative stress, um, neuroinflammation, demyelination, and uh, then degeneration of the axons. And uh, MIN-102, according to our data, is able to treat all these aspects that occur downstream. Uh, to give you a flavor of the experimental profile, um, I'll just highlight two experiments of many others. Um, first of all, in mice, uh, it is able to improve motor function. Uh, these are so-called double dockout mice uh, that lack the ABCT1 and 2 genes, and that yields a very severe phenotype. And the ABCD2 gene is, to some extent, able to compensate for the loss of the 1 gene. Uh, so these mice have motor impairment. Uh, when you put them on a rotating rod, uh, they have the tendency to fall down very quickly. And what you measure is the latency to falling down from that rod. Um, so uh, untreated, I hope this is, where's the pointer? Here's the pointer. Um, doesn't work here. Um, so the first one is uh, the control. So these are the untreated animals. And you see in a dose-dependent manner, uh, the mice are able to maintain their function, that is to stay on the rod. Uh, and the panel to the right is, uh, is a very classical model. It's called the EAE, the Experimental Autoimmune Encephalitis Model, where you induce uh, a cerebral inflammation uh, that is very often used in multiple sclerosis research to demonstrate efficacy. Um, and here you also see that uh, compared to controls, which is a dark bar, uh, MIN-102 at different doses is able to reduce the disability called by, uh, caused by the cerebral inflammation. Uh, what I haven't shown you is data uh, also in, in in vitro. That means in a test tube, uh, MIN-102 is able to protect neurons from uh, very long-chain fatty acid damage. So that gives us a full picture 
of its work and uh, like other uh, companies uh, we have discussed that with health authorities uh, both the European, the EMA and also the FDA are actually very supportive, very helpful. They invite you for a dialogue, uh, you can discuss designs, endpoints and everything with them and we have gone through that process. Next slide. Uh, then we went into phase one, uh, which was a study in healthy male volunteers. Um, we tested various doses, both single doses and also multiple doses. Um, safety and tolerability were very good. Um, uh, the data showed that this is a very simple administration, a once daily oral administration. Uh, we tested higher doses and we are going to need in our clinical study that is always good to demonstrate a safety margin for adverse effects. Um, and uh, we had a couple of brave volunteers um, who volunteered for lumbar puncture. That means we could not only assess drug effects and drug levels in the blood, but also in the cerebrospinal fluid. And these data, first of all, confirmed uh, that the drug is reaching um, the central compartment. Uh, exactly in the ratio that we had predicted from the animals and also it had effects on various biological markers related to PIPA gamma agonism uh, that was again a repeat uh, of the animal experiment so very nice translation into man and an important point here is uh, that the effect size at the PIPA gamma receptor uh, needs to be fairly high to treat the disease. And this is shown in the uh, blue box uh, down in the panel. Um, if you use adiponectin, which is a molecule that increases with PIPA gamma agonism, um, you can sh see in the animal experiments that you need certain multiples of the increase from baseline to be really efficacious. And um, the two bars there, dose one and dose two, show you that these were the two doses that were tested in man. And they uh, yielded exactly the level of uh, increase in PIPA gamma engagement that we need. And, uh, what you can probably not see is the little gray bar below uh, that our experiments indicated that as long as you take labeled doses of pyoglitazone, of actos, you cannot achieve that level of PIPA gamma engagement. Um, that means uh, you cannot just go to the pharmacy, get a prescription for pyoglitazone, and um, it will treat the disease um, unless you take doses that are multiples over and above the labeled dose. Um, next uh, slide. Now to the phase two study. Um, I think um, we started with a dilemma. Um, that is, on one hand, the FDA wants what they call evidence consisting of adequate and well-controlled investigations. And the dogma is, of course, uh, it is a double-blind, placebo-controlled design where patients are randomly allocated to active treatment or to placebo. Um, and we believe since AMN is a fairly slowly progressing disorder, usually we need two years of treatment to demonstrate any effect. And that is a very hard thing for patients to accept, uh, to be in a study, to be exposed to placebo for potentially two years. Uh, we discussed it uh, not only with ALD Connect, but with other patient advocacy groups and were very, very grateful for their input. And. Um, what we heard was, well, it may be acceptable, uh, provided, first of all, maybe there's a higher chance to get active treatment. Uh, so we chose a randomization of two to one. That means two out of three patients will receive active drug and only one placebo. And the other one is that we are offering a long-term extension for those patients who complete the two years of uh, double-blind treatment. And after that, everyone will receive active drug. Next. Um, now, what are we going to determine in that study? Um, safety, obviously. Um, uh, it entails regular visits uh, in the initial phase of the treatment, more frequent, later on less frequent. Uh, we look at blood levels. Uh, we regularly look at MRIs to see whether there are inflammatory brain lesions or not. Uh, then a couple of tests uh, that are important from an investigator's and regulator's perspective uh, that will be uh, motor function with the ability to stand and walk, 
muscle strength, spasticity, sensory function, uh, and then an overall assessment of the disease severity and improvement. But uh, what came out of dialogues uh, with patient um, advocacy groups like yours, and as I said, that was very, very valuable for us, that often patients' perspective is somewhat different from regulators' perspective of what is important. So what we heard is, uh, for example, apart from ability to walk, it's the incontinence that is really disturbing. Um, so we have also included parameters um, to, to assess any effects on, on these episodes. And also patients will be invited to rate their improvement apart from the doctor. And we're also looking at some scientific aspects or experimental aspects to promote knowledge about the disease. That means we will measure biochemical parameters, a repeat of what we saw in the animals. <clears throat> and uh, there will also be uh, patient volunteers again uh, for lumbar punctures in, in one country in the Netherlands. Um, so we will look at that as well. But that will only happen in, in the Netherlands next. Um, Eligibility criteria uh, for that study are um, adult males up to 65 years uh, with remaining ability to stand and walk, uh, no contraindications to MRI, obviously, um, not showing cerebral inflammation, uh, no previous bone marrow transplant. Uh, then there are some medications that we have to control and then obviously so, uh, one of the class is anti-diabetics because we don't want uh, any unwanted effects here. Um, we will allow certain other medications provided the dose will be kept stable during the trial. Um, and uh, since many patients are living remote from investigational sites, uh, quite a distance away, um, it uh, also affords your ability and, and willingness to travel. Uh, but we are providing travel assistance and will compensate for travel expenses to make your lives easier. Now, last slide is, um, as I said, we hope to start enrollment in Europe very, very soon. Uh, so we have green lights from several countries and uh, we will start second quarter next year in the US. Uh, rest assured, um, ALD Connect will be one of the first to learn when we start enrollment in the US. And we are also working with other patient groups in Europe. And the same, we are using their channels uh, to, to let patients know when, when we're going to start. So I'll be here today and tomorrow. If you have any questions, I'll be there. Thank you. So uh, I'm not mistaken with the order, the next speaker is Dr. Steven Horn from uh, or Fredericks? Uh, I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon. I was at Stanford for a long time before going into the biotech industry. Um, got frustrated with treating one patient at a time, which is what you do as a surgeon and a physician, and had an opportunity to go into biotech where you can become part of a team to help perhaps develop a therapeutic for a whole class of diseases. And so that, that captured my imagination as it does many other physicians, both in academics and industry. So. I'm, I'm glad to be here with you today. I want to talk to you just very briefly and at a very high overview of what an emerging biotech company, Ophiris, is going to be doing uh, with respect to the childhood form of, of ALD. Next, I guess I can advance. So you've heard a lot today about um, some of the origins and the pathology of the, the cerebral form of ALD that happens in children. And ultimately, what happens as part of that process is that it, the cells in the brain, the microglia, which are the immune cells in the brain and, and the astrocytes, become swept up in that process. And that's the process of neuroinflammation. And that neuroinflammation produces a lot of uh, factors that can be harmful to the myelin and harmful to the neurons. And if you had a way to address those particular cells, you might have a way of impacting the course of disease. And you've seen also the MRI scans that show the degree of inflammation, that far one on the uh, left here. That's the degree of changes by the MRI in the white matter. Typically starts in the back of the brain. And if you look way over here, that's a PET scan. It's a far image on the right. And that PET scan shows where those particular cells are now active. So there's a lot of overlap between the changes we see on the MRI scan, the clinical changes in the patient, and what the PET scan says are the cells that are starting to help drive some of that neuroinflammation that's contributing to the process. And when you overlap the images, 
you see where the gadolinium enhancement, which is again another marker of the degree of inflammation happening in the brain, where they both overlap in that third image. And one of the ways that, that cerebral ALD is treated is bone marrow transplant. And, and the working mechanism there, we think, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but we think that some of those immune cells, the microglia which are diseased, are being replaced or normalized by the bone marrow process. And that helps stabilize function. Has really been a solution to those patients with cerebral ALD. But unfortunately, about half of the patients that present, if not more, are at a stage where they're no longer considered eligible for bone marrow transplant. And those patients don't have any active options for therapy at all. So we're developing a product that may be able to help address those particular group of patients and potentially perhaps other aspects of ALD. So one of the interesting things is that uh, a known approved drug, N-acetylcysteine, which is used for patients who have acetaminophen poisoning, and it has strong anti-inflammatory and strong antioxidant capabilities, has been tested in patients who have a less score, and that's a reflection of how much burden they have by MRI scan, and been shown to improve survival when it's been used in conjunction with bone marrow transplant. It's also been shown to help reduce the degree of white matter changes there on the left to after bone marrow transplant and the neck. You can see the, the change and the reduction in the MRI manifestation of the disease. So a very interesting potential application of a known drug, but the interesting thing is it does not tend to improve neurological function. So it improves survival, which is good, a sign that something's going on that's positive, but it's not necessarily perhaps getting to the cell that's specifically driving the neuroinflammation. So the company has developed a nanoparticle. A nanoparticle is simply, that sounds a little scary, but it's just a bigger particle than perhaps some other drug molecules. And it can be designed in a way that actually may make it very specific for certain diseases. So that's the nanoparticle there. You see all the different branches. And on the surface of it, there's hydroxyl groups. And that may help facilitate diffusion of the drug through the brain, which is an important attribute of these nanoparticles. But it's been conjugated to N-acetylcysteine, which is the antioxidant, anti-inflammatory. And it can cross the blood-brain barrier, particularly when the blood-brain barrier is inflamed, which it is. It's open in these children. And it can reach the microglial cell, which is the cell that is driving the inflammation. And then when it gets to the cell, it normalizes the cell. It takes it out of that inflammatory state, where it's pumping out all these bad factors, and normalizes it. So that may be one of the ways that bone marrow transplant works, where we may be able to achieve a very similar effect in children who are not eligible for bone marrow transplant by quelling the active microglia. So there's a potential here, again, to think about addressing not the entire pathology of the disease, but something that may be creating quite a bit of the pathological chaos in these children with cerebral form. And that's the microglia, the activator microglia, which are that way because of the underlying disease. And this is work that's been done by Dr. Fatimi in his lab, um, where we can take the dendromer and the NAC that I just showed you, that nanoparticle conjugated NAC, and put it in in vitro, in dishes, where the macrophages derived from human patients with CCLD have been stimulated by the very long chain fatty acids. And when you do that, uh, and then you apply the OP101, which is the name of the product, you see a change and a reduction in TNF-alpha, which is a, one of the pro-inflammatory factors. And you see a change in glutamate, which is one of the cytotoxic or oxidative factors involved. So when we put this this particular drug on cells that are stimulated from patients with CCLD, we see changes that are very consistent with what we might expect to see for the same microglial type of cells that happen in the brain. So this is very important proof of concept. This gives a company like the Ophiris the, the confidence to move forward uh, that this could have a very strong therapeutic benefit. So with that and many other animal studies that I'm not going to show you, uh, we've been able to show that the cell that is driving the neuroinflammation is impacted by OP1 to the point where behavior, so function of these different animal models, actually improves that are driven by the neuroinflammation. They're not specific to ALD because the ALD mouse model uh, does not have the neuroinflammatory component. So as a result of, of all those animal studies with groups that have been done by the founders and scientists at John Hopkins uh, and multiple interactions with the FDA, the company is now poised to begin a normal healthy volunteer study where we'll get an understanding of the pharmacokinetics of the drug, so what the drug is doing in the body, and that will help us understand not only safety as we move into children with the disease, but also how we select dose and perhaps the frequency of the dosing. There'll be a phase one, two, three trial, and this is, the, this is something that I think is very innovative, and I think um, it, it's starting to emerge, and even the FDA commissioner now embraces this type of concept, particularly for rare diseases, where 
it's very clunky to do a phase one, a phase two, a phase three. Is there no way we can wrap all this up into a phase one, two, three? It's a one study, one IND, one submission to the agency, one submission to an ethics panel. And in fact, uh, the company has done a lot of work to get to that point with the agency. And so it will be a combined seamless phase one, two, three study that will start with a phase one, two, that's open label, where we'll find dose escalation, establish safety in the patient population, and also look at MRI response, and I'll talk about that in a moment, in a, in a limited number of patients, six to nine patients. As that study is completed, that will roll immediately into seamlessly a phase three study that will be randomized and placebo controlled, a double blind with IV administration of the drug. And here, again, there's been a lot of work done with the agency that's actually starting to reflect an openness to some flexibility of how these trials can be done. They understand the rare incidence of the disease, and they know that phase three, large phase three studies can't be embarked upon. But we can perhaps reach a point where we can convince ourselves and the agency and patients that there's a therapeutic effect with probably a sample size of only 20 patients. So this is all the legwork that goes behind the scenes when you interact with the agency to design these studies. But this, I think, is, a, from my standpoint, having done a little bit of drug development, a very important milestone to achieve with the agency to be able to have one study, which is good for a smaller company, because that's something that can be executed in a reasonable period of time. One of the things that's going to be very interesting in the study is to look at what happens with the MRI scan, and in particular, what happens with the enhancement. And, and you can see that at the end of those black arrows, those little white fluffy areas, that's the gadolinium, which is the agent we give an MRI scan that leaks through when the blood brain barrier is disrupted by the inflammation. Well, after bone marrow transplant, it's been published, that goes away. That matches the stabilization of the disease clinically, but we see that it means the cells that are driving that, that underlying neuroinflammation has also been improved. So um, we're very curious if we can achieve that same ef effect in the phase one, two component of the study where, because that's an open label, the researchers will have the ability to look at the MRI scans in real time. In addition to understanding the safety and, and dose considerations, we were very anxious to see whether we can achieve that same type of outcome, meaning that we've engaged the cell, that we've impacted the cell, and we've changed the natural course, at least by MRI scan. And I would argue then we will change the door, course of the disease clinically. So I'll just finish up now. Uh, the plan ultimately will be this will be some type of routine frequency of an IV administration of the drug. Uh, the plan is to reverse the neuroinflammation or at least stabilize it and therefore stabilize the neurological function in, in the children who are now considered ineligible for bone marrow transplant. So this is the more severe, more advanced form of CCALD, but one where we know there's a large unmet need. Um, we've had multiple meetings with the FDA, all of which has been very productive. Uh, the FDA actually has a lot of interest in this particular study and the particular design, and that's, you know, I, I congratulate the team uh, at Ophiris for putting together that type of, of solution for the trial. We were fortunate to get orphan drug designation this year, and if we're uh, even more fortunate in our phase one, two, in those first few patients, if we can see a robust clinical effect, that gives us the opportunity to do breakthrough therapy designation, which again allows us to accelerate the development and ultimately produce the product. It's going to be a multi-center trial, probably four to six centers within the U.S., all the usual suspects that you can imagine, and our plan now is to hopefully initiate this in 2018 as we move forward. So with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. Next speaker will be Gary um, So I'm actually going to uh, recap some of the slides that Florian stole from me this morning. No. <laughs> uh, but no, but just uh, highlighting some of the uh, uh, differences, um, not differences, but highlighting some of the, the, the nuances, I guess you'd say, um, as soon as the slides come up. Oh, there we go. Uh, so as was mentioned this morning, Bluebird Bio is developing an ex vivo gene therapy product called Lenti D for the treatment of patients with cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy. So, so what do we mean by autologous ex vivo gene therapy? What that means is that a patient's own cells are harvested and then by apheresis and shipped to a central lab where those stem cells are transduced by a lentiviral vector that introduces functional copies of the ABCD1 gene into that patient's own cells. So these modified cells are then frozen down and shipped back to a transplant center where the patient undergoes myeloablation or chemotherapy with busulfan and cyclophosphamide. 
and then the cells are thawed and reinfused back into the patient, where they're allowed to engraft and presumably differentiate into monocytes that migrate to the brain, further differentiate into microglial cells, and hopefully produce functional ALD protein, or ALDP. In our phase 2-3 clinical study uh, that Florian introduced this morning, we study patients for two years after receiving Lent-ED gene therapy. And then the patients actually enroll into a long-term follow-up study where they're followed for an additional 13 years to monitor the long-term efficacy and safety of the product. So our phase 2-3 clinical study is called the STARBEAM study, or ALD-102. And to date, the 17 patients treated with Lent-ED have completed up to two years of follow-up. Data for the, that first 17 patients, that first cohort of 17 patients, was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. However, the study does continue to enroll, and we've expanded the cohort so that we not only treat patients here in the United States, but we started treating patients in Europe as well, so trying to expand this program globally. Eligibility for the trial are boys less than 18 years of age that have evidence of active but early cerebral ALD that being positive for gadolinium enhancement or contrast enhancement, a positive less score that's less than or equal to nine, and an NFS score less than or equal to one, so an NFS score of zero or one. Patients cannot have an HLA match sibling donor to be eligible for this study. The primary endpoint for the study, first in terms of efficacy, is the percent of boys that are alive and free of major functional disabilities at that two-year mark post-treatment. The primary safety endpoint is the percentage of boys who experience either acute grade two or more graft-versus-host disease or chronic graft-versus-host disease. So what do we mean by these major functional disabilities? Florian mentioned these a bit this morning. These are six severe disabilities that are typical of cerebral ALD that are characterized as such because of, they have, of their, profound, um, their profound impact on a boy's ability to function independently. So they are loss of communication, cortical blindness, tube feeding, total incontinence, wheelchair dependence, or complete loss of voluntary movement. So our primary endpoint is a percentage of boys who are alive and free of all of these six major, major functional disabilities at two years post-treatment. So for that cohort of the first 17 who have, who are all at, who have all reached that two-year time point, 15 of the 17 uh, were alive and free of major functional disabilities at month 24. So 88% of that initial cohort met the primary endpoint. Unfortunately, there were two patients who did not meet the primary endpoint. Uh, patient 2018 listed here had a very rapid decline in neurologic function, a rapid increase in the neurologic function score immediately following treatment. He did eventually develop multiple MFDs and unfortunately passed away from the disease. Patient 2016, the second patient who did not meet the primary endpoint, did not actually develop any of the major functional disabilities. However, due to some evidence of radiologic progression, as seen by MRI, his physician and family decided to withdraw him from the study so that he could undergo an allogeneic stem cell transplant. He unfortunately passed away from complications from the transplant. So although our hearts certainly go out to the families of these brave boys who did not um, survive the study, the remaining cohort definitely gives us hope that with the 88% remaining free of major functional disabilities at two years, that LENTD is potentially a promising new therapy, not only in terms of efficacy, where that 88% is similar, if not somewhat higher, than the 75% MFD-free survival that's seen in the literature and seen in our natural history study that we performed, but also in terms of safety, where all of the boys remain free of any of the immunologic complications that are sometimes found with allogeneic transplant. All boys remain free of graft-versus-host disease. There's no evidence of graft failure. 
In addition, there's been no evidence of clonal dominance or insertional oncogenesis, and no detection of replication-competent lentivirus. In fact, the majority of adverse events are generally consistent with myeloablative conditioning. And there were only three that were deemed related or potentially related to lent -ED itself. There were two grade one episodes, one of vomiting, one of tachycardia, and a grade three episode of BK-mediated viral cystitis, all of which resolved by standard measures. Florian went through the neurologic function score this morning, so I won't spend too much time here now, except to point out that in the bottom right-hand uh, graph, that's data from our ALD 101 natural history study, where we looked at change in neurologic function score over time for untreated patients who had comparable early cerebral disease. And as you can see, pretty much the majority or all the patients had a rapid increase in the neurologic function score uh, following diagnosis. This is quite different from the change in neurologic function score that we see with patients treated with lent -ED. With the exception of patient number 2018, who had that rapid increase in neurologic function score, the majority of patients remain relatively stable in terms of neurologic function score. In fact, most of them had maintained a neurologic function score of zero throughout the two years on study. One patient, 2016, who, with, who withdrew from the study, he did have an increase in NFS to one. There were two other patients who had an NFS increase to one that eventually resolved back to zero or returned back to zero with more length of follow-up. And finally, one patient that we're keeping a special eye on uh, did have an increase in NFS to two at month 24. And of course, we're monitoring him carefully in the long-term follow-up study. This profile is quite consistent with change in neurologic function score for transplanted patients with comparable early cerebral disease. It's not unheard of to see patients that have this rapid increase in neurologic function score even following transplant. However, the majority remain relatively stable over time. A secondary endpoint of the study was resolution of gadolinium enhancement. I mentioned before that to be eligible for the trial, you have to be positive for contrast enhancement at time of enrollment. That positivity is reflected by the orange Oh, look at that, by the orange lines. Resolution of gadolinium is depicted by the green circles. And so at enrollment, everyone was positive. By six months, as expected, all but one had actually resolved their gadolinium, their contrast enhancement. But what was surprising is that there were a handful of patients that our single-blinded reader deemed positive for gadolinium enhancement at later time points. However, that gadolinium enhancement post-transplant was always classified as diffuse, hazy, less intense. And you can see examples of that on the right, comparing the screening enhancement to the 12-month um, hazy uh, return. So we're very interested to understand what this means, what the clinical significance of this hazy reemergence of contrast enhancement is. All we can say right now is that like I said, the contrast is markedly reduced compared to post-treatment, and that reemergence doesn't appear to correlate with any clinical outcome. For example, the majority of patients had a maintenance of NFS of zero, regardless of if they had a, a hazy reemergence of gadolinium. And the one patient, 2018, who developed rapid increase in neurologic function score and eventual MFD never had a reemergence of that hazy gadolinium enhancement. So we're still trying to assess what the clinical significance of this is, but we're really interested to, to study this further. Finally, an exploratory endpoint was change in less score. Comparing on the bottom, change in less score for transplanted patients, allogeneic transplanted patients, a very similar profile to uh, patients treated with lent -ED on the top. Basically, a modest increase in less for the first year or so that eventually plateaus off once the therapy takes effect. So to summarize, 17 boys have completed their 24 months of follow-up. 15 of the 17, or 88%, remained free of major functional disabilities at that time. There were no treatment-related um, GVHD was reported, and the adverse event profile is consistent with myeloblative conditioning. 
We've treated four additional boys since January of 2017, and so we're very excited to see the outcomes of, of those treatments. And we're very excited that we treated our first boy in Europe a little over a month ago. Enrollment continues, so we continue to enroll patients, and discussions are ongoing with the FDA and the EMA in Europe to really outline the best path to get this approved for patients more broadly. So with that, I will turn it over to the panel, I guess. Right. So what we want to do here is um, engage in a conversation where we have had actually something called the Industry Advisory Council now with ALD Connect, and most of you have been there, if not all of you have been there. Um, but I think one of the main sort of objectives here for us is to try to, do, to maximize the degree of engagement that we can have with each other. So obviously bring all these amazing you know, products that you have as soon as possible to the bedside. And so from your perspective, I think that what, what I would like to know, I think what Florian would like to know is, what, what is it that you want us to do? How can we help from an investigator's perspective perhaps, or from a, from a patient's perspective, what can we do to get you fastest to your goal? Yeah, I mean, I think from a patient perspective, um, oh, hi, I'm Sanjay Magavi from Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Um, I think it'd be great to see, you know, more and more patients, you know, register with um, ALD Connect, um, engage in the patient portal. Um, so, you know, that'll give us a couple of things. I'll start to give us some natural history. It will start to uh, help us understand how many patients are out there, and it could be really informative way of having patients be engaged. Um, so um, from my perspective, uh, the thing that matters most uh, to drive this is data, uh, human data. And uh, the time to human data is, is a cost to an emerging biotech company. And it's a huge point of stress, financial stress, for the smaller companies in particular that are trying to innovate. And so anything that centers, investigators, and patients can do to facilitate shortening that time to data um, is, is, would be very, very helpful. And it's, it's not rocket science. It's getting through IRBs and budgeting and contract agreements for the trial initiation as, as expediently as possible. And then it's working with the sponsors to identify and recruit the patients. Well, to add my, my part, I think um, I've we previously worked very much uh, in, in the area of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease um, where I visited sites but I've never seen a single patient. Um, so it's much more top down. Your biostatistician tells you uh, you need 400 patients in that study uh, but you never see them. Uh, so for me uh, the dialogue with patient associations is extremely beneficial and fruitful and I think if you can facilitate that and you have done that so that is extremely valuable. And the others echo my Stephen, right? Stephen, uh, that uh, when we started designing our program, there was a lack of data. What is the natural history? What is a parameter that shows us a disease, the disease, the symptoms are declining or not? Um, and uh, I think we can all benefit from that. Particularly in Europe, there's a high reluctance very often from patients to share data. It's this fear of uh, big data revealing and you don't know what is done with the data. But I think I can promise that we work with the data area uh, responsibly. And uh, so that, that's the other part, really data, it's history data. I guess I'll reiterate what these two guys just said, is we're, you know, we're in a case of always trying to raise funding. And when you talk to companies or VCs or other agencies, um, interested parties, they want to know what your clinical trial designs look like. And it's difficult to look at a two-year walk test as your primary endpoint. So looking at, and you guys have done a great job at the Norix in identifying them, but the U01 grant, we keep going on that, and because there's a question of biomarkers and validated biomarkers, as well as quality of life outcomes that are becoming more of a topic now as well. I agree. I mean, I think data is, is the key, but I think, you know, one thing that, that Ben mentioned earlier is about, you know, in talking to regulators, they didn't know anything about this disease. And I think anything that we can do partnering to raise awareness about the disease outside of this room, right? So the pediatric neurologists, the endocrinologists, the pediatricians, the school nurses who first see these boys, 
how can they know where to go, where to find that information? Because for all of us here, our, our, our mission is to make sure that all patients are treated and it gets the, the best treatment for them. And so what could, any type of education that we can do to raise awareness of this disease, I think would be huge. Okay, well, I think you guys covered it all. <laughs> but um, I think to, for us, is again, raising awareness, especially as we go. Well, uh, Globally, with the study, um, interaction with patient advocacy groups is going to be key to get our study enrolled. We're going to some pretty remote I guess, areas um, where we will need the patient advocacy groups. That's the only way we're going to be able to identify patients and enroll our study. So, with the support of the community, we should be able to enroll successfully. And, you know, we've had great interactions with KKI, Valley, and Florian. And, you guys really have helped us out. So we appreciate it, and Arabia. I just remember from uh, in Lawrence's oil placebo control trial at Kennedy Figure, we thought that en enrollment wasn't going to be a problem, but it ended up being a problem. And uh, part of the reason the study was terminated uh, was because there was some issues in terms of adverse events in the placebo group, but also because we couldn't enroll at the pace that was originally sort of thought of. And, and it strikes me, I think that should be an issue, but I think that tells us again why it's important to have that sort of patient portal and being able to be in communication with people who are out there. I mean, at that time, this is 2006, you know, six, seven. there was no Facebook, you know, all these things that we have, social media wise today wouldn't exist, but I think there's certainly a potential to, to reach out there. Um, Questions for panel? Okay, my name is Ingrid Street and uh, I'm a mother of an elderly boy. I have just a comment on this when you say you're lacking data. Um, I would love to give away data, <laughs> and but we don't know where to send it sort of. And I asked the hospital, can we check different markers? And they always say no because that won't change the treatment. So no one is checking <laughs> what could be checked. And even if I can wince them to check something, where should we send it? <laughs> so if you can pick up on that. Florian and Alex Sherman. Thank you for the question. So, uh, is that chair for me? <laughs> so, so uh, the data are extremely valuable, and we'll be talking about this tomorrow. How can uh, anyone could, could contribute to this? So, the brief question is it's still kind of terra incognita, an unknown thing. Who owns the data? Right, so we were all politically correctly stating that patients own the data, but this is not true. So, uh, I mean, uh, ideally, and uh, I see the trend here that uh, in the nearest future, you will be having your USB with all your data, or, you know, it will be embedded under our skin on some kind of RFID, and then we can donate it to anyone who wants to study the data. So, but it's not there yet. So uh, one of the things to do is to lobby your clinicians to contribute clinical data. And then, uh, as we will be talking tomorrow, uh, through patient portal, you can also contribute. And we're looking forward to your input tomorrow, actually. I will be asking each and everyone in this room to tell us what you believe will be the best from the patient's perspective, from the industry perspective, to ask to get from this patient portal uh, uh, tool, if you wish. So this is just a tool. I, I don't really have a question. I have more of a comment, which is, it is so inspiring to hear from all of you and to know that there are companies and organizations taking an interest in ALD. And as an adult man, I'm 33, I have AMN. Yeah, bravo. Uh, 
you know, when I think about the next five to ten years of my life and as my health, you know, declines and where it's going to go and the twists and turns, uh, it's just so inspiring. It brings me so much hope to think about what could be, what might be. And I think I speak on behalf of, of all adult men, you know, uh, that the work you guys are doing is, is tremendous. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I've just got a question. Uh, my name is Brian Chandler. I think I've met most of you. I'm on the board of ALD Connect. And, and I wanted to ask uh, each of you if, if you're able to, to speak for your respective companies and to address what would you all do with the data once it's been analyzed and will, can you or will you all commit to sharing the data after you're done with it? I mean, I can start I, from, a, from a clinical trial standpoint. So we have obligations with regulators to follow the patients for 13 years. Um, but what we'd like to do is um, shift the trial to more of a registry monitoring, like once we reach a certain point in a post-approval setting. And then we're in talks with, with ALD Connect and Neurobank in terms of how to, once the FDA gets the data that they need, how can we add that data to the broader data set? Currently in our one of three trials, we have an observational outcomes trial for allotransplant that we're using as a comparison for our, for our 102 trial. And currently in the consent form for our 103 trial, we have the opportunity to consent for um, ALD Connect and Neurobank as well. So we are very eager to share the data as soon as it's appropriate to do so. I would reiterate what Gary said. I think the data is looking at CCALD versus AMN. I think on AMN, you know, the data that's more relevant um, is are there quality of life or early signals at three months, six months, and you know how. Can you identify and validate those so that you could get a drug approved with one year worth of data instead of two years worth of data and long-term outcome trials? So that data is beneficial. I think from a, you know, sharing as quickly as possible through publications, I mean, it's pretty typical once you finish a trial that you have the data out there, and then as Gary mentioned, also through um, databases. Pretty important to do that. Yeah, from our perspective, uh, I think we are planning to publish uh, more data on in one or two step by step, so non clinical experiments, human uh, study data. Uh, I think the worst thing for us is, of course, uh, if a trial is negative uh, you know, there is a, rel a reluctance to publish, and then the companies tend to hide away. But I think uh, we should do that and, and really overcome that reluctance because everyone can learn from that. Yeah, I, I think all these points are more relevant even for the smaller indications. Uh, which is what all of us are wrestling with in terms of ALD. Um, there's more and more requirements now that things be transparent, particularly after there's been approval in terms of data. Uh, but I think, you know, your point is well taken. In every trial, even if it fails, we can learn. And I think, uh, to, to be truthful, co companies can do this a little bit better. Uh, but there are, there are mechanisms to do that, and I think it's a very good point at the end of the trial, good or bad, that um, the investigators, and, and typically the academic investigators, are very vested in doing this if the company isn't. Uh, so there's ways to get that information out there. But I think um, it, it, you can see the spectrum of trials being done now in another two to three years, I, I would bet we'll know a lot more about the disease than we know today, which I think will be informative for everyone. Okay, so I can't speak on data from the interventional studies. I. I I don't know um, what the current plan is, but for our non-interventional study that we're conducting in the United States, written into protocol, is it the plan for us to share the data with the ALD community? That specifically who we will be sharing with it is yet to be defined, but we do have a commitment in Neurovia to work with ALD Connect and the community to get the data from our non-interventional study out to you once we're done with that. I think, uh, I think you're asking exactly the right question and moving in the right direction. Um, if patients really demand that this data be made open and uh, available to the whole community, um, I, don't, I think industry is not going to be able to resist that pressure. So do 
questions, I think. Okay, maybe one last question, and then we're going to try to move on. Hello, um, I'm Kathleen O'Sullivan Fortin. I know all of you from the IAC. I'm um, a board member for ALD Connect. I was wondering if anyone has any plans for any of the AMN studies to include women in a cohort, or if that's a separate trial, or is that part of your trial design? But just to be clear, looking around this room, it's not just a men's disease. Um, yeah, as AMN is concerned, uh, in an ideal world, you would uh, target all populations. Uh, just you cannot throw males and females together in one study because onset is different, symptoms are different, progression may be different. As in an ideal world, uh, you would do that. Uh, we are a very small company and we have uh, sufficient funding to fund the male study, so we would not start it unless we can fund it until its end. Um, so we are forced with this limiting funding to uh, take it step by step. But uh, if, if there are positive results from the male study, uh, we are going ahead. So unfortunately, I think female AMN is somewhat a neglected entity. It's always coming last. Um, but uh, we, we can't raise more money than we have. Being an AMN, I would agree with that. And I think it's We've heard today even the complications of looking at the female progression of the disease is a lot more challenging. And so to start with men is it's the way to go. It doesn't mean if it gets approved in men, women can't use it off-label. So. Okay. I think uh, we're a little running behind. So thank you again. Thank you very much.